Welcome back to Still a Part of Us. We are so grateful to have Anna here and who just barely told us her birth episode of her son, Liam. And um, so welcome back, Anna. And we're excited to talk with you and just have a conversation. Thank you again for having me. And in order to give everybody a little bit of context about your son, please tell us like who you are and, and, and a little brief overview of what happened to him. Yeah, um, I'm Anna and I am from Honduras. I currently live in the Chicago area and that's where I was living when Liam was born. Liam was my first child and he was stillborn on his due date in 2016 for unknown reasons. And that was a heartbreaking story to listen to. So I'd recommend listening to it. It was it was beautiful and um excited to talk a little bit more about where we left off actually, because you you buried your son and but that it seemed like that created something in you where you were trying to do something for him. Um can you tell me about how that journey has looked for you after he he was physically gone? I want to say immediately when I found out he had died, I knew I wanted to never let him be forgotten, make his life mean something and build a legacy for him and help others who would be experiencing this in the future. So I instantly knew I wanted to donate my breast milk. That was something that I had learned about through my job, bereavement yeah. milk donation. <clears throat> so it immediately came to mind and I asked the, I told the, the staff at the hospital, the nurses uh, that I wanted to do that. And they said, okay, well, we'll, we'll have the lactation consultant come and talk to you. Okay. And the lactation consultant came and talked to me and she was completely baffled. She mm. literally was speechless yeah. when she said that. She said, I just, I don't know what to say. I've never had someone say they want to do this. And, and I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help you. And I said, um, you can bring me a best breast pump and show me how to use it. Yeah. Let's start with that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. That was kind of my first step to making meaning out of Liam's death Yeah. and, and helping other babies. I knew that by donating my milk, I would help other babies who were sick or who otherwise needed it, hopefully survive and thrive thanks to his breast milk. Yeah. Cause a lot of women, it really is like, wow, that is, that's amazing. Cause a lot of times it's like, how do we suppress the milk? How do we have it, uh, prevent it from coming out? How long did you end up donating, um, your breast milk? For a few months. I, um, didn't have any kind of set date or ending in mm -hmm. mind. I just mm -hmm. went with the flow. And um, over time, as I kind of reintegrated into my free loss normal life, yeah. I was like slowly decreasing how much I was pumping. And so, of course, naturally, my supply was also decreasing. And I just sort of slowly weaned off of, of pumping and donating. Um, but it was from, you know, since he was born until. December, at some point in December was when I stopped pumping completely. So yeah, it was for a few months. Yeah, that's really cool. I, was it also hard though to do that? Was that something I would think that would be hard? Like hard in, in what sense? Like it well, was, it was hard. Not having, well, yeah, <laughs> yes, that is pumping is difficult. Um, but also just not having him there. Does that make sense? Like I think that was one of the reasons why a lot of women are like, oh, this is just another reminder that he's not here, that I can yeah, feed him. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think a lot of people think that, but that mm -hmm. wasn't my experience because my experience was each and every time I was pumping, I was, yes, I was thinking he should be here. This yeah. is his milk. He should be drinking it, but he's not. I can't change that. So every time I was doing that, I knew this is going to help another baby. This is going to help yeah. another baby. Liam's helping save other babies. Yeah. And so if anything, it felt more rewarding to me to do that than it, than it felt hurtful or hard, you know, beyond like, what, it's hard to live 
your life after your baby's died, yes. period. Yes. So it didn't really, it wasn't a reminder. I didn't forget at any point during any of those days that I was pumping and donating that he had died. Yeah. So for me, it was comforting and it was healing and it was helpful. It was helpful to have a mission. I had to pump every so often. I had mm. to monitor what I was drinking, what I was eating, what medications I was taking. I had to carefully store the milk in a certain way. I was um, a, an approved milk bank donor. So they're very strict on their criteria yes. for being able to use that milk for, for other babies. Yeah. Um, so it gave me like actual, like something to do that was very important. And, and so I had to like follow all these guidelines and things. And sometimes I would just sit there and like reorganize the milk in the freezer or like recount how many ounces, you know, it, just, it gave me something to do that yes, was very meaningful. Yes. Yeah. And it gave me a reason to take time to myself to go sit in a room and pump. It gave me an excuse to get out of a situation I was in that maybe I didn't want to be in. I got to go pump. I, I'm going to go to the that other room and gr- pump. That's great. Um, it, it gave me, you know, time when I was out and about to say, I need a place to pump. And I remember I was at a museum one time and they said, well, we don't, we don't have a space. I said, well, find me a space or I'll sit right here on the floor and pump in your hallway. Cause there's an outlet right here. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then they opened up a room for me to go into. Oh, like, oh, okay. So um, it gave me a lot more than, than it was like hurtful or sad outside of the regular sadness and hurt I was feeling anyways yeah and I think that's what a lot of a lot of the people who are guiding us in those early days think oh the suppress 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 that's kind of like the default yes recommendation or mentality because we live in a culture of let's forget about the baby period so let's try to eliminate any type of reminder that a baby ever existed in your body yeah so yes let's suppress the milk let's hide all the baby things yes let's just erase it all and in fact something like pumping and and donating your breast milk gives you a lot of purpose and meaning and healing and it's very fulfilling especially to know you're literally helping to save other babies in your baby's memory yeah and that is really beautiful and it's so I am like oh yeah, we do do a lot of things to hide the baby or hide the memory or not mention the baby. And, you know, that's why we have this podcast, but I was like, oh gosh, there was a lot of things. You're right. That we do in order to make it a forgotten event, right? Uh, Something that gets swept under the rug, if that makes any sense. Just kind of like, Mm -hmm. uh, nobody, we don't want to, we don't want to bring that up. Oh yeah. That's something to think about today. (laughs) Now, um, Anna, did you, so after you um, weaned yourself off of that, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like you've had a, a bit of a journey. So tell me what happened next after that, that helped you continue healing. Yeah. So that was kind of the, the start into my journey of Liam's legacy and making change in his memory and, you know, improving the lives of other babies uh, because he's not here to live his. And so simultaneously, as I'm doing, you know, donating his breast milk, I start doing other small acts of kindness in his memory. And so whether that was, you know, or you can go to a restaurant and pay a dollar to write their name on something and then we feel good just because we get to see their name posted up on some board somewhere. Um, Or, you know, I started giving away some of his things. And there were some things that were much easier to give away than others. Like a a lot of his things I've kept to this day because they have a lot of sentimental value for Mm -hmm. me. And I also kept a lot of things thinking of a future baby. Yeah. Um, But like his diapers, I started giving away his diapers and, you know, wipes and small things like that. And all always with, with the thought of um, other babies who aren't welcomed into the same type of environment necessarily as I had prepared for Liam. Yeah. And I always thought about how I was very well positioned to have like the best possible outcome. I had the right education, the right job. I had 
you know, OB nurses and doctors who were my colleagues who I worked yeah. with every day. And I had great friends, a great family, uh, home, you know, I had all the right things supposedly in place. And I had all the things, um, I had the three baby showers. I had yep. everything I needed for Liam. And then, you know, what it actually really hit me when just a couple of weeks after Liam was born, there was a baby that was abandoned, a newborn baby that was abandoned oh. in a field cool. near where I live. And it was devastating to me to think like that that family was so desperate, whatever they had yes. going, they were so desperate that they, they they couldn't think of anything else to do than, than leave this baby in the yes. field for whatever reason, you know, whatever was going right. on with them. And to think like, wow, Liam was going to be welcomed into to, to my life and be so loved and cared for and, and have all the things he needed material and otherwise and then there are babies who are who are being born into this world in a completely opposite situation so yes. I just wanted to make that better for other babies yeah. um, and help other families with their babies and so that has kind of been my continued mission over the years and, and how I've learned to carry out my motherhood with Liam um, I feel like I knew something instinctively innately like we don't lose our maternal instinct mm -hmm. even when the baby's not here like it doesn't yes. go away just like our physical symptoms of being pregnant for 40 weeks don't go away yeah um it takes time and healing physically emotionally mentally and I think that the process of grief is a lifelong journey especially when it comes to child loss, infant loss, baby loss. Um, and what I believe is the best way to cope with that or manage that that grief to, to heal in the best way possible, um, maybe not the best way possible, but in a positive way yeah. Yeah. Um, is by living that experience and, and by, you know, navigating your journey and figuring out what does that look like for you? Like, what does your motherhood look like? And so for me, it was helping other babies in Liam's memory. That's how I have lived my motherhood with him. And so, you know, over time of like doing small things here and there um, in Liam's memory that, you know, evolved into a nonprofit organization you know, five years later. Tell me a little bit about how it this developed. Like, because, you know, giving diapers is one thing, but then like, getting to the point where you're essentially doing like diaper drives, right? Like that's, I, I think I would love to hear more about that. I would love others to hear about what you've done on his behalf. Yeah. And so just as like, I started out with donating his breast milk right away. Like that was yes. the thing I started doing. And then I start doing other small things here and there, you know, for the holidays, um, you know, I celebrate Christmas. And so <clears throat> what I would do was like, well, Liam's not here to buy him all the Christmas presents. So if he were here, I would have been spending that money on him. So I'm going to like basically sponsor <laughs> another child who would be his age. Yes. So doing, you know, doing that. And then as that sort of doing things in his memory, building up and I'm, I'm doing more and more in that regard. I'm also doing more in the bereavement space mm -hmm. in the grief space of things. And so I think because of where I worked more than anything, mm -hmm. All of a sudden now I'm getting, you know, I live this experience and, and now people are referring other people to me. Like, oh, oh, you just lived this experience. Well, you know what? My friend just went through that or my friend's friend or, you know, even in, in my job, it was referrals from people that I worked with. Like, oh, you went through this experience. Well, I have this patient. And oftentimes it was Spanish speaking patients mm -hmm. well there are very limited resources in the United yes. States for Spanish speakers who experience a pregnancy or infant loss so it was well could you talk to them they just need someone to talk to and so that was always the the referral was this person needs someone to talk to and so it was literally within days of, of me having Liam and being asked to support other people wow. which in retrospect I'm like blown away by that I'm like I was in no position <laughs> to provide yeah support or any type of coaching or guiding for, mm -hmm. for anyone else I'm I'm fresh too and I'm trying to figure this out myself but I think because of not only my job and, and that sort of knowledge and education that I had right. but also my past history with navigating mm -hmm. 
trauma made me sort of uniquely positioned to be able to do that, even though I was so fresh in my loss. Um, and then adding on to that, that I could speak Spanish and be a support person for, for a lot of Spanish speakers. So yes. that sort of role of being a support person starts evolving and growing mm -hmm. and the, you know, doing things in Liam's memory, helping other babies in Liam's memory mm -hmm. is evolving. And um, what we say really became the start of Gifts from Liam as an organization was for his first birthday when I was trying to figure out how I was going to celebrate or honor a birthday for a baby who isn't here. Yes. And I started doing my Google research on how to do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, diving into Facebook groups and social media, like how other people have done that. And yeah. somehow ended up learning through that process about the diaper gap and diaper need, which at the time referred to the fact that one in three families couldn't afford enough diapers for their babies. And that once again, just really shook me because I was like, I never, the, the thought of Liam not having enough diapers, like the most essential thing for yeah. a baby never crossed my mind. And yeah. not because I was wealthy, but because I had support. Yeah. The support had, system. Yeah. I had the support system and it never crossed my mind that, that Liam wouldn't have something as, as basic as a diaper. And to think that a third of families with babies have that concern, have that stress, like, and, and knowing yeah. with my background and in public health and in perinatal care, like, okay, people are stressing about diapers. They're not really focusing on what they need to focus on with their baby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to hold a diaper drive for his birthday. That which was is, how we decided to celebrate. Which is so and cool. <laughs> yes. And then I had no expectations for how that would turn out. I didn't have any goals again or anything, just like with donating breast milk and uh, we received about 20,000 diapers in that very first diaper drive. Yeah, that's that was my reaction to <laughs> Whoa, that is crazy and awesome. Whoa, yeah, okay, so that's cool. That became a thing. So then I was like, all right, well, I guess we're going to be having diaper drives yeah. for Liam's birthday for, you know, years to come. And uh, now, you know, his, his seventh birthday was just last week and we had another diaper drive. And I having worked in, in the nonprofit world mm -hmm. was always pushing against making gifts from Liam, a nonprofit oh, okay. uh, officially. And on many occasions it was suggested to me, it was kind of put in my path. And I always just said, no, this is just what I'm doing to honor Liam. Yeah. This is my motherhood journey. If yeah. I make it a nonprofit, then there's just so many other layers that are added to it that are yeah. going to kind of like take away from from the motherhood journey and kept getting put in my path. And I always say that Liam is the one who kind of guides me in, in what I do. And there were just so many like series of serendipitous events that happened that really enabled me to, to make that step into to really? officially making Gifts from Liam a nonprofit. And so in 2021, Gifts from Liam became a nonprofit. And so oh. Just as over time, uh, the things I did as as his mom in his memory to help other babies have grown. You know that has just that has just continued. And after becoming a nonprofit, um, and just in general becoming more well known and recognized in in lost communities, in in local communities with families um, with babies and experiencing diaper need, um, it's just really grown over time and blossomed and evolved. And I always think of it as like, well, my motherhood journey would have gone through all these changes and evolved if he were here too. And mothering a seven-year-old wouldn't look the same um, as it did when, when I was mothering him as a one-year-old. So mm -hmm. to me, it's always at the, at the core, it's, it's how I am living my motherhood with Liam. Yeah. I think that is so beautiful to think about ways that you have like, how can I just honor him throughout as he's, as he changes, right? Like in your, in your mind, as he grows up and I, I'm just like astounded by the number of diapers you probably have had donated over the years. I'm sure it's, yeah, it's gotta be a lot of diapers. If you got 20,000 that first year, I think that's amazing. And are you, um, primarily working on 
gifts from Liam then? Is that what you generally do on a day-to-day basis or are you still working at the at the health department or I guess you're the maternal oh, health? The, the perinatal center? Yes, exactly. Uh, no, I actually took an interesting leap from the perinatal center into um, the ice cream world. Oh, and <laughs> really? <laughs> Yes, I've always worked in public health, healthcare, and yeah. capacities. That was always my uh, passion, even from a young age. I wanted to be a doctor because of um, an accident that I was in. And then when I came to the United States for college and learned about public health, I realized that my passion was more aligned with what the public health field is. And so mm-hmm, kind of mm-hmm. shifted gears a little bit and, and was more in public health world. But um, I was just at a point in my time with the perinatal center where I needed some change and uh, I had a good friend slowly kind of introducing me into his ice cream world (laughs) um, sort of just like assisting with translations and attending different meetings to to serve as a translator and then when he decided that he wanted to launch a business he asked me to to partner with him in launching this ice cream equipment sales business so I was um, running an ice cream equipment sales company for a while with my buddy and it was great and it was fun and it was novel and I learned lots of new skills. I learned a lot about ice cream and ice cream equipment. (laughs) (laughs) Then um, with COVID that died uh, because we we were largely selling to like mom and pop shops and so everybody was shut down. Nobody was buying equipment. And so um, then I was no longer working there full time and kind of slowly transitioned away from that. And that enabled me to spend more time on gifts from Liam because at the same time that COVID is happening and the ice cream business is dying down, diaper need is growing. Completely. Yes. And so it it worked out because then I was able to spend more time in gifts from Liam and and helping support that becoming an organization um, and just doing the work. And then, um, you know, I also had at the time a two-year-old. And who yes. was whose school had shut down. So I had my my two year old at home. I'm a single mom. Oh, yes. I'm trying to sell ice cream equipment and run a business and run a nonprofit, which yes. wasn't a, yet a full blown nonprofit, but <laughs> it was too much. So um, then from ice cream equipment, ended up in the world of medical writing. And mm. so that is my profession currently. And that's uh, a contract basis. So yes. when I'm in between contracts, again, it allows me to dedicate more time um, into gifts from Liam, which ultimately that's my desire is to focus exclusively on gifts from Liam and kind of other related projects and, and yes. consultancy things I do um, sort of under the umbrella of, of gifts from Liam and loss and helping babies. Yeah. Um, but because it's still a, a labor of love, I have no choice but to to do other jobs too. So yes, medical yes. writing is is a nice mental break from the heavy work that is involved in in gifts from Liam, but it's also boring. So I appreciate having both my my passion and uh, job to pay bills. Yep, I was gonna say it's a means to the end. It's not the end necessarily. <laughs> yeah, That's what I and say a mental too. break from the, yes. the, the, the heavy yes. emotional work. Yes, it really is. And, and we'll post a link about that in the show notes about gifts from Liam. So if you are interested in donating and helping or needing bereavement services, because I know that um, that is an option, then please take, take, take a look at that. I think that is very worthwhile what you're doing. I wanted to check and see when, um, I know you mentioned in your birth episode that your relationship was a little bit rocky with your partner at the time. Um, did that, you mentioned it got worse almost because of this loss and that happens a lot. Did you guys break up at, shortly after or did things deteriorate faster, um, because of the loss? I, it, it's always just, it's always something good to be aware of, especially if you're in a relationship, like how, how we navigate that or n- not navigate that. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about how your relationship evolved from there? Yeah. Um, earlier on, I felt like 
we were, we became closer. And I think that's because we were the two closest people to Liam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, But as time passed and as we both were grieving in our own ways, which were very different, we grew apart and more attention built. And I'd say the relationship did get worse. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we still stayed together. I think because of that tie to Liam. Yeah. And then we ended up uh, conceiving our second child together nine months later. And so he is now five. Yeah. And uh, we separated when he was only two months old. Okay. And uh, was that just a good, I mean, I'm not saying it was good, but was, was that good. appropriate? I was going to say, I was like, was it good? Was it appropriate? Was it fine? Was it hard? Um, because like you said, you're a single mom. So that is, that adds, that's a lot of extra added, um, responsibility. Yeah. And it it was both good and hard, but it was, it was the best decision that I could make for for me and my, my baby. Yeah. Okay. And I, I also wanted to talk about your, your rainbow baby. Can you tell me the decision to maybe have another baby how was that decision made or was that also another surprise to have to have that baby? That was a dis- it, a decision that I made to not make a decision or not make a plan, better mm. said, because I felt that I had spent so much time, effort, energy into planning for Liam. Yeah. And then it all went out the window that I thought, well, I don't want to plan to have another baby and try to have another baby Mm -hmm. and go through the emotional turmoil potentially of trying and not being successful or, or saying like, you know, because I was advised to not get pregnant for at least six months realistically our bodies need much more time than that to mm-hmm. heal um so even thinking about that timeline and planning that timeline and then trying and then what if we're unsuccessful and I didn't want to go through that and then I also didn't want to go through a process of of deciding okay no we're not going to try to have another mm-hmm. baby okay and then you know maybe years later be trying again and not being able to, and then looking back and potentially being regretful mm. that we didn't try then. Um, so I ended up saying, I'm not going to plan anything <laughs> one way or the other. Gonna and be whatever nervous. happens, happens. Okay. <laughs> so okay. nine months later, I was pregnant. Was that a surprise to you then? It, yes and no. Like it, what, We weren't preventing pregnancy, and we also weren't actively trying to conceive. Okay. So it wasn't, it wasn't a surprise either way. Um, what I did find difficult in that time was the unknown. It was every month. Am I pregnant or not? Mm. And going through that. And then sometimes being like, Oh, I think I might be, or, um, you know, and they're kind of like waiting for is is my, am I getting my period or not? Oh, I might be a little bit late. And I, I got to the point where like, I just stopped like tracking too, but I couldn't help, but sort of, always have that kind of be feeling mentally. of like mm-hmm. I might be pregnant and then immediately going into the the emotions of well what if I am what if I'm not am I yeah. happy that I'm not or am I sad that I'm not am I happy that I am am I sad that I am yeah um, it's all over so the yeah, place it was, it was going through that every month and then once I was pregnant um as you know the whole experience of pregnancy after loss is just about as difficult as the loss itself. Yeah. Was there anything that you did in order to navigate that? Um, I mean, yes, it is. I, I will agree with you. It is like, it was one of the worst things or hardest things that I went through because it felt like I was not breathing for nine months and, and just anxiety, like ratcheted up even more, just worried, 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 worried all the time that things would go wrong. And yeah. Well, like, and especially I, I think that when you have a late term loss, right? Like you were at 40 weeks, I was at 38 weeks. You're like, you're like, okay, I lost a baby at this point in time. Then I can breathe after, you know, once I pass that mile marker or whatever, 
I was like, with a late term loss, you're like not breathing for the entire time. So is there anything that you tried to do or what you wanted, tried to be intentional about as with this pregnancy so that you could have a little bit of relief? I guess maybe is a good way to ask that. Yeah, I, um, well, I agree with you. Number one, like it was, it was nine months or in my case, I was, I was induced early to Mm -hmm. try to help prevent what had happened to Liam. And so I was induced at 37 weeks. So, so first of all, I was like, so this second baby isn't even going to be inside of me for as long as Liam is. So I truly will never reach a point of like, Oh, I made it past. Yes. That like never. And and even that, I think most people who've had a, a pregnancy loss, even if it was earlier on, lose the innocence of like you reach some point and everything's going to be fine. And even yeah. into once our children are here and alive, we still, I feel like live with a heightened sense of death. And, and half the time when I, when, when I, when he's away from me and I get a call or a message, it's like, is something wrong? Is something happened? Um, and, and so the journey of trying to navigate that anxiety, I don't know how long that goes on for, but I think, but I know five years later, I'm still navigating that anxiety and and fear of your child dying. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that we, we, we just have to live with as, as lost parents. Mm -hmm. And, um, while I was pregnant, I did intentionally try to do some things to help manage the anxiety and fear that comes with being pregnant after a loss. And um, I was in therapy for one, mm-hmm. and I was even intentional in the therapist that I selected, who was a therapist who had also experienced child loss. Oh, her her child loss was very different. Her, her child was um, much older, late teens. But oh. at that point, I had already learned like there's some connection that you experience with other bereaved parents yeah. that you don't have with, um, I call them normies. So <laughs> regardless yep. of when the child loss occurred. And so I appreciated that she had that lens. Yeah. And um, I found it difficult to connect with my new baby Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to connect with that new baby because you know part of me was like well if I remain disconnected and pretend like there isn't a baby growing inside of me then if or when they die it's not going to hurt as much yeah and like we I think we know that's not true but we just we try (laughs) we're trying to tell ourselves whatever we can yeah it's like a survival Ew. instinct, I think, honestly, just like, I can't yeah. get hurt again. So I'm going to just not get connected. Like I'm not going to. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's weird. <laughs> and while having those thoughts, also telling myself, that's not fair to this baby though. Like this is a new baby. This mm-hmm. is hopefully going to be a different outcome. I can't control whatever the outcome's going to be, but let's assume this baby does make it. And then I I will have regrets about not fully being present in that pregnancy and, and connecting with that baby in that pregnancy. And um, even if the baby dies, what will what will I be less sad about? Having a pregnancy where I created memories or having a pre- pregnancy where I pretended it didn't exist? Yeah. And I decided, well, I would rather have a pregnancy with memories to because I because I know those are important to me in in my journey with Liam yeah and in fact I was like I wish I had more memory for mm-hmm. my pregnancy with Liam I wish I would have taken the weekly bump photos I wish I had done belly molds and all these things and so then I did incorporate those into my mm-hmm. rainbow pregnancy because then I thought if this baby dies at least I have these memories yeah, yeah. and it also helped me to intentionally connect with that pregnancy and with that baby. I don't know that that those things necessarily made the anxiety or or fear go away. I think what really only helped me with coping with that was um, in the end, and I started having to go to the more regular checkups, like, okay, he's still alive now. (laughs) I only have to wait two more days to get confirmation that he's Mm -hmm. still alive again. And 
taking it day by day or sometimes hour by hour, minute by minute and using, you know, positive pregnancy cards and mantras and meditations. And I participated in pregnancy after loss support groups, had my pregnancy after loss mom friends. All of those were were different tools and strategies that I leaned into to help get through that pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah. And you do like, yeah, you just find what you need to. I just love the fact that you decided, like, I would rather have the memories, even if there is, especially if there is a bad outcome. Again, I want to have memories of that. So I think that is a lovely piece of advice to, in order to connect, right? To connect with your Mm -hmm. baby. Anna, this has been such a, a great conversation. I am just like super inspired with your, your gifts from Liam. I just think that is like, it just makes me so happy that like all these little babies are being taken care of because of Liam. And I just am so impressed and I would encourage all to go check it out. And I know that your current, your day, this, this year's diaper drive has just passed, but I, I'm sure that there are, you, you still have opportunities to, um, help and donate when you can. So please check that out. Um, Anna, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, as we close, is there any last bit of advice that you would like to share with other lost parents that will be navigating this, this journey too? I would say, especially for those new to this, who may be completely foreign to the the concept of stillbirth is that even though your baby was stillborn, you're still a parent. And it's really important to learn how to be a parent and parent your child, even though they're not here. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you, Anna, again, for your time today. Thank you, Winter.